Hello and welcome everybody who's tuned in to the CV Strategy Masterclass for 2022. I am delighted to introduce Erica Reckamp, who's here to host the Masterclass with me. Erica and I have been connected on LinkedIn. Um, I've been following her. She's unbelievable in her content posting, but she's also a professional resume and CV writer. So welcome, Erica. Thank you for co-hosting the CV <laughs> Strategy Masterclass with me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for having me here. It's, it's great to get to know you better and I'm happy to be of any help that we can. Fantastic. And I'd love to let everybody know who's watching it from wherever you are around the world to share with us the city that you're watching it from, whether you're catching this live on LinkedIn or whether you're catching it in the replay, do let us know because Erica's based in the Northern Hemisphere in North America. Her time zone right now is early morning and she's got snow outside and I'm based in the <laughs> Southern Hemisphere in South Africa, Cape Town and I'm ending my day. It's five o'clock my time and I'm in the heat of summer. In fact, Cape Town's just come out of a heat wave. So we'd love to see who's tuning in and who's watching from wherever in the world that we might find you. Another bit of housekeeping, Eric and I will be leaving all of the links to everything that we discuss in the comments of this live, and we'll also be answering your questions in the comments when this goes live. So by all means, tag us in the comments and ask us whatever questions you would like to around setting the strategy for your CV. All right, I'm going to get straight into it, Erica, and not waste any further time. I'm going to kick off by sharing with everyone what my top three strategy tips are for once you have the document. So you've developed your CV, you've got this great document, and after using, you know, running through these three strategy tips, you might then choose to work with a professional CV writer, or you might not. And then Erica is going to go on and pick up and share what her top three tip, tips are for actually crafting the document. So starting off, I like to teach that you have, I mean, firstly, a CV is a living document. It's constantly Absolutely. evolving as your career constantly evolves, as you study new courses, as you take on new projects, as you pivot, as you leave roles, as you start entrepreneurial ventures, your CV will always evolve naturally. So why not then keep the evolution of the CV up to date as easily as possible by managing a master data document for yourself on your own PC? So in other words, a master data document, that's a Word document that nobody ever reads but yourself. But right, you too much information. Have, <laughs> yes, exactly. No, this never sees the light of day, but it has all of the dates, it has all of the information and all of the places that you can constantly add to it to keep it up to date. It's a Word document, it's easy. You're constantly able to just refresh it as you go along. And, you know, I think perhaps one thing to say is that we all need a CV, whether we're job searching or not, right, Erica? I mean, yeah, I agree. And it's so much easier, even if, if they don't use a resume, if it's someone, if it's a field that uses an application portal and says, I mm -hmm. never want to see this resume for whatever reason, they're, maybe they're trying to improve their DEI sourcing, you can still access that master data document to find those dates quickly and easily to pull the relevant accomplishments that you might want to mention. So having that resource will streamline your process immensely. Absolutely. And then back it up and email one to your grandmother so that you never, <laughs> you never lose it. <laughs> Upload it to the card and keep the source of it. But, so you've got this master document, as, as Erica said, that you're able to extrapolate and you and upload into applicant tracking systems. My strategy then is you've got the master document. And you then, from that master document, would extrapolate and create role-specific documents. So whether it's something that you need to upload onto an applicant tracking system, whether it's something that you need to upload onto a company website specifically for their, I mean, that's perhaps the same, applicant tracking system on a company website, but in some cases it might not be. Because they're synced, yeah. 
they're, they're combined, but you create a role specific CV. And this is a simple, it, it would be relevant to the industry that you're in. So if it's a financial services or a logistics or a supply, it would be a very simple CV in terms of nothing too grandeur and no much, you know, not too much fluff versus if it were the marketing industry or digital or, or copy industry that where you might want to extend the CV to have it look a little bit more interesting. So irrespective of the industry that the CV is going to, you would then create this role specific CV. And it's a simple PDF document that you would then upload. You've run it against applicant tracking system um, criteria in terms of what's necessary and what's not and what would be a definite no-no. And we'll get to that in a bit. And then you've got the simple CV that you send out. My third strategy tip is that you then create a more personality-based CV in the instances that you're going to send this directly to a human being. So you've got somebody's email address that you might want to send it to. So that would be a CV that you could perhaps share a photograph of yourself or you want to perhaps include different color in terms of the font or design elements on the CV, which again would be PDF, but it could be the exact same CV as the role-specific one in terms of content, but it just looks different because it might be more eye-catching for a human being to actually read it. Yes, the role-specific CV ultimately is going to be read by a human being, but it needs to go through so many electronic systems, right, Erica, before it actually gets to those human eyes. So that right. has to be bland and as simple and black and white as possible. Very correct? concrete and fact-based, correct. And then even when you are pivoting, if you do want to add a, a splash of color, for the human eye, you want to be careful it's not too slick or overhyped, right? Because we're mm. still kind of leading with the value. So even if you do decide to maybe reflect the company brand colors to try to show alignment or highlight key areas, creating a pullout um, graph or box, uh, just make sure that that the focus still remains on those key takeaways that you'd like them to walk away with. That's absolutely great idea. So we've got a master document CV that we look at, we review. That's the living document that we're currently updating all the time. It's an ongoing, growing story. And then we have the concrete role specific CV, which is bland, which is just you know applicant tracking compliant. And that's what you would send to a non-human being. And then you've got one where you can show a bit of personality, but bearing in mind it's not going to be, you know, the content still leads. It's not about the color or the images because that can be distracting and Absolutely. it can be frustrating for somebody trying to get through that to really read the information. So you've got your CV for a human, which is colorful, CV for your applicant tracking systems, and that all comes from your master data CV. And then my fourth tip in terms of the strategy of your actual CV itself is you would then have your dream career folder. Now, that in itself is another whole masterclass. So, Erica, we're going to have to come back and do that perhaps. <laughs> what is a dream career folder? Well, I like to teach that you keep a folder on your desktop or wherever where you literally are adding notes and saving job descriptions, paragraphs, words, things that excite you when you read about other jobs and you're extrapolating all of that and putting in your dream career folder. That language that you would read that somebody else might use in their advert for a role that you might not even be interested in applying for, but just one paragraph or one sentence really grabs you, that's stored in your dream career folder. You review that constantly when you're extrapolating from your master data CV and creating either the concrete applicant tracking compliant version or the slightly more interesting version for a human because that's where you get the keywords from. That's where you get the language. Correct, right. Erica? And, and you attract what you put out there, right? Yeah. The the things that the app applicant tracking system or the sourcing tools or somebody who's doing searches on LinkedIn, if they're looking for specific types of language, like they're looking for a transformative leader, a catalyst, a, ch a change agent, if you are representing yourself with that language, you will attract those sorts of opportunities. Mm, that's exactly it. I like that. It's like the energy of the documents just going to attract the right information. Why would it not? Of course. <laughs> so, so those are my top three tips from a strategy perspective. And this is what 
everybody should be doing, whether you're job searching or not. We should all keep a living document available with, with the information and the things that we do, the short courses and the, the stuff that we do within a year, it's so easily forgotten. Um, I remember back in my former career when I was a recruiter in the corporate world, you would people would send you and you would ask for it in many instances, the CV and you know any relevant documentation or, or any relevant supporting documents. And then you would get these beautiful folders of, all of the degree certificates and absolutely everything scanned <laughs> in. And, you know, it would be like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. Or they would come for an interview in the early, revealing my age. <laughs> in the early, oh, no, oh, no, no, really? no, my goodness, that's a party. <laughs> Never mind. A flip file with all the original. I mean, when I first started job searching when I sort of got my university degree I was so proud of them I'd carry them around in my flip file and, and so forth but that's really a little bit kind of it's useful, cumbersome right? yeah so cumbersome. but yeah if we've got it all consolidated in the one document and then mm. it's not such a chore when an opportunity does come along that's the perfect thing you didn't even know you were looking for or when you do finally decide, hey, I've been in denial about this position for far too long, and I really do need to leave, <laughs> you're ready. And when you lose those certificates, when you put them in the shoebox and you send them to your parents' house and you ask them to take care of them, or you put them in the storage <laughs> unit and the certificates suddenly disappear, you open the box and there's just fragments of paper because the fishworms have got them, you've still got your master data CV with all of the dates, with all of the information. So that's that's the essential and that's important so that's the kickstart of the master classes how do you work with the cv like do you have to have it renewed every single year and pay a professional resume writer yes you probably do if you need to have it specifically crafted and you're looking at the brand and the tone and the identity that you want but they're still going to need all the information that you have on your master document cv they'd want to see erica your you know, non-human version of the CV and the human version of the CV. Right. So that raw data needs to come from you. You know, as yeah. a as a resume writer, I can't make up what you did for a role. I can't know. I can't manifest all your awards <laughs> and, <laughs> and your metrics. So it's best practices just to keep that working file going so that when you are ready, whether you decide to do it yourself or whether you do decide to hire someone, that you're well prepared to do so. Exactly. Yes. So now you're going to get into letting us know what your top three strategy tips are for the actual crafting of the document, because we do need to cover that because that's such an important part that's of what we need to know, process. right? <laughs> yeah. Everyone needs to know. Let us know. <laughs> All right. So the first most important feature of a successful piece of career collateral, resume, LinkedIn, what have you, is that you have a very clear target. Uh, a mm -hmm. lot of people go too general or they neglect to hone once they've got that master document. They neglect to really focus in on a distinct target. And this helps you in a number of ways. It helps the reader have a clear indication of what sort of roles that you're targeting, right? Mm -hmm. So if, I, if I'm fielding resumes from candidates, I need to know exactly where in the org chart you would fit. I need to know exactly what team you might complement, right? So that's EQ, hard skills, soft skills, and a clear indication of the types of titles you're targeting. If you don't have a broad idea of the types of roles that you're targeting, take a look at, um, there are a couple different websites, like I think org.com goes through and actually talks about the org structure of organizations, mm -hmm. or looking through LinkedIn postings, like you mentioned before, can be really helpful in figuring out what are the titles that they're using currently, right? Because what mm. they used to call, you know, it used to be marketing specialists. Right now it might be omni-channel strategy or it might be social media marketing. The, mm. the go-to, like it used to be digital marketing. Now social media marketing is what they're using. Mm. The, the catch words change. So it's a very important distinction for you to make sure that that's fresh and targeted, finely targeted. Because if they mm. don't know it's really hard for someone to advocate for you, even if they like you. Um, and I, I so appreciate that point. It's so necessary and it's so important, but that comes with the clarity around 
what am I actually looking for? What am I actually going for? You cannot simply get a one size fits all CV that's going to tick all the boxes and splash it out in the market and think, you know, the person that employs me, maybe that's the job for me. I mean, that's right. We can't expect them to connect the dots and do that yeah. homework for you. Right. Yeah. So being very clear will help advance your search tremendously. Mm -hmm. um, the right. second stage, once you've got that clarity is to really diagnose from a hiring perspective what the concerns might be. And that's where you might need some help, either from your friends, a trusted coach, um, someone that you know in the industry or hiring a professional to figure out what, what are active flags right now. So, mm -hmm. and what, what parameters might they, those have? So for example, jobs hopping or career gaps, it could be a non-issue. If you're in a, in a high demand tech field, they understand people have short-term consulting assignments. They understand that people are frequently poached if they're top mm -hmm. talent, but they would still like to get the best out of you while you have that skill set, then they might overlook a lot of those characteristics in someone's work history. If it's a field that really values um, commitment and, and longevity building up, and Right. And building mm. up a community and, and gaining that trust, rapport relationship, mm. right? Then it, it might be an issue if you have multiple brief tenures or significant gaps that are unexplained in your work history. So mm. understanding what might be an issue and what might uh, cause concern can be very helpful because it might change your content strategy for the document. It might change mm. how you craft that work history, what you decide to include and exclude. And mm. within that also is crafting that content with career progression. So oftentimes people just call it a career retrospective, go reverse chronological, but each mm. section has the exact same amount of information. And it's yeah. full just job description, everything I've ever done. That's not going to work in your best favor, right? No. It's going to bore your reader. They're going to kind of get bored <laughs> to tears and flip through to the next CV. Well, and it's a failed opportunity too, because if you're able to craft that content, to call it strategically, so that we have progressively more and more information as Bills. you proceed, it is a wonderful way to not only show career progression, but subtly drive that point home that you're a very strong investment, right? Mm -hmm. You're approaching peak. It's not that you peaked five years ago, right? Mm -hmm. If we show five, 10 years ago, this huge section with tons of pros and lots of accomplishments and your most recent role is two sentences. Three lines, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. You're most concerned with what you've done lately and that it's relevant to your current role. Mm. Do you have something mm. to add to that point? I think, you know, it's it's such a great point. And so many of my clients struggle with that, struggle with the, as you say, showing the progression rather than showing audit, you know, backward pro progression of this is how, how great it was in the past. And then it's almost like this blank space of, and they must assume what the future is going to hold, let's tell them, let's, let's let them know. Um, and I suppose that's where you can really bring it in in the executive summary and the language you use, the sort of the overview of the narrative of the document is what leads the reader to this person's on the move. They're, they're, you know, we, right. We've got a rocket versus we've got a perfect piece of art that's not going to get any better. You know, it's right. reached its... <laughs> yeah, and, and even if you've been able to attain the titles... You know, if you've been director, VP, SVP, EVP, mm. but at EVP, you have no metrics and no scope really written mm. out, they're going to think, well, maybe they actually couldn't thrive there or maybe they're mm. winding down. So mm. you can actually introduce concerns <laughs> by not carefully crafting that work history to tell yes. the message that you want it to tell. Yes, absolutely. And then That's lastly, great. oh, go third. ahead. No, I was going to say, and your third. <laughs> oh, perfect lead. -in. So you want to consider what you want to talk about. So this resume is a, or CV is a marketing piece. Mm. And we want to consider what are the key takeaways? What are the things that you want to pop out of the document? Because mm. let's face it, most often, 
when people are looking at your resume, they're just taking a quick glance, right? They're busy working, doing whatever it is they have to do. They get a quick reminder. Oh yeah, I have to talk to somebody at three o'clock. Oh, they take a quick peek on their phone or they print it out and just glance at it. I think and the statistic I read, be... sorry, the statistic I read somewhere was like, it was a three minute, like. Quick, it can be even six seconds. Yeah, like it's so. Yeah, you can't expect. You know, they're not going to lean back with a pipe and their big leather chair, and <laughs> <laughs> go through and relax Read, with your yeah. CV. That doesn't happen, right? Mm. They're quickly just glancing at what can I talk to them about? Okay, they were on a soccer team in in university, and okay, they mm. they managed to cut load time sixty seven percent. Okay, I'm going to ask them about those few things. Mm. So you want to be really careful. Give it the glance test, right? What's popping mm. out? Is is it mm. just your section headers? That's not helping you. <laughs> mm. Absolutely. And I think that that overview of how the document reads is one element of the strategy. The, you know, the trajectory, the, you know, you're building the momentum, the, the words, the keyword, you know, that how it reads, so important. But another element in that six you know six second glance or whatever is how it actually looks like does each page have a number i mean these are basic things but they can so often be left out so the actual how it looks is it is it you know is is there big gaps of white space is it well formatted the actual you know just like you relax when you open a book and you read it and you feel like the author has borne you in mind when they've printed it versus the effort sometimes it takes to read a book. And I'm referring to like, you know, medical books or like <laughs> anatomy books where it's really hard to try and get into it. I mean, I, clearly it was just, you know, a necessity for medical students to have to read that article. They weren't creating it as making it a reader-friendly book. Right. <laughs> you know, another whole topic there. But so that, that, that overview is important. The overview of the message and the overview in terms of, the actual how it looks, the readability, not in terms of the content, but when your eyes glance over it, are are they supported and they do they get relaxed or is there stuff that just starts to make just busy, crazy just stuff? noise? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Noise or things that might be out of balance where you know there's big whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, there we go. Right. Moving on quickly to the do's and don'ts. I'm going to share my top three. Do not put this. Do not do this. Um, we're all at fault. We're all, you know, it's it's a learning process. So it this changes, is the, right? Exactly. This is why we're here offering our, our help in the masterclass. And then we'll hand over to Eric and she's going to share her top three don'ts. So the first for me is <laughs> don't upload your CV on LinkedIn on your profile in your summary section or under your experience section upload it on linkedin but in the relevant job section where you can then click one apply or send it so into the the career search section but the profile itself that is for you to express your personality that's for you to stand in your brand your career identity it's not for you to have a one-dimensional CV that somebody's going to be clicking and downloading. So please don't, 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 don't do that. I see that happening often, Erica. Right. right. And you want to populate those fields, like you said, fill out the experience section mm. fully because that does help you land higher in search results and attract more opportunities. You're not yes. saying that. You're just saying no. don't attach the resume. It as a document. The other thing is that makes it less likely that a recruiter or headhunter or hiring manager will reach out to you because there's because one less thing to talk about, right? Yeah. Give them a reason <laughs> to reach out to you to start that conversation. Even in marketing, they talk about there are a certain number of touch points to build a warm relationship mm. with someone. And that's mm. actually what we're doing when we're deciding who we want to hire. Who could I work yeah. with? Who could I have a friendly rapport with day to day if I'm going to be working this many hours with them? So we want to yeah. build that opportunity for touch points by yes. having them reach out for the resume rather than just handing it out. Or, or, or just letting it hang there and having no idea who's reading it and who's not reading it and who's downloading it. And a one size, you know, one CV doesn't a one size fits all. It can't right. possibly speak to everyone. No but opportunity saying, to customize. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So really the, your LinkedIn profile then in a way whets the appetite, shares some key tips, 
uh, one you know, or two bullet points of achievements that once you read it to call and invite for the CV. Your CV is not a replica of your LinkedIn profile and your LinkedIn profile is not a replica of your CV. The two are completely different completely. career search tools. They're simply tools, but they've got to be completely different. You have a built up stra a different strategy for each of them, which brings me to my second point is don't download your LinkedIn profile and think that that's a CV, like the section where you can download and save to PDF. That, that's that's the ugly. worst it is so ugly to do. Yeah. Ugly. It's five pages. It's not relevant. And don't do the opposite of, you know, using all the, putting everything on your CV, on your LinkedIn profile. As I said, the two are completely separate. So don't do it ever. And, <laughs> and I see it happening often. And I think we're going to be the CV police, actually. And we're going to <laughs> call it out and start stopping. So definitely <laughs> don't different, do that. Yeah, they're different tone entirely. Mm -hmm. Different tools. Completely, completely. And then my third, do not do. And this is an interesting one when Eric and I were talking because she does share a different opinion. And I suppose it can be um, adjusted depending on the tone, yeah. the overview, and where, what the strategy is with your CV. But I 100% teach that you do not put your references by name or contact number on your CV. And I've written a blog about that, and there are three specific reasons why. And if you head over to my company page on Friday and click and, you know, follow my company page on Friday, I'm going to send out the results of the three reasons why. But I'm just going to share the first. And the first for me is that you get to control who's contacting that person. Your work references are the most important connections and contacts that you need to nurture and protect. And if you're ad nauseum leaving the CEO's contact number or email address for anybody and any recruiter to read, he is going to be 100% spammed and borderline abused, and it's all directly resulted to you. So if anybody then phones him to say, can you tell us about Erica's time that she worked for you, you might not get the best response at all. So I 100% prefer references are made available on request. However, in certain instances, Erica, I know that there in the States, you have to have three names, three contact numbers. That would be very specific. What so are those? Actually, go ahead. Yeah, so what actually in the United States, um, we say do not write references available upon request at the bottom of the resume. Primarily because it's assumed, right? If they yes. ask for anything of a candidate, they assume that you would comply, right? I'd like to see so, your portfolio. Happily, I'd be happy to send that over. We'd like to have a, at least three references for each each position. Absolutely, mm. I'll prepare that for you. Mm. Um, the only caveat for not providing the references up front, which in general, I completely agree with. It's mm. it's irrelevant information. You're taking up precious real estate on the resume that should be devoted to positioning you as the top candidate rather than listing housekeeping type information. Mm. Um, the only exception might be federal roles in the United States. Many sure. of the expected formats for resumes request your direct manager's name and phone number. Yeah. So not all, but an in general best just to leave it off. This document yeah. is meant to market you, not be a phone book for somebody else. Exactly. And, and I love that. Absolutely. Don't even say references will be made available on request. Of course, it's, of course they would. Why, why would they not? <laughs> I'm not going to be <laughs> difficult. I would like this job. <laughs> I, I will give you what you need so that you can qualify everything that I've said about myself in this document so you know it's interesting in terms of um well the big great reshuffle great resignation and everything that's happening everything plays out in the states in a probably kind of like it used to be i remember when i was in my corporate recruiting career it would be like a two to three window before the ripple effects had got to southern hemisphere or hello africa but now everything's changed because we have global organizations and the world has become this hybrid mix so you could be based in cape town working for an american organization it doesn't really matter so the um the information around that is just great to update and and kind of align to global standards so that's the opportunity that you all have by watching the master class here <laughs> 
sneak peek, what's coming? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, what's coming? So those are the, the absolute don'ts. I would love to hear any questions that anybody might have. Should you be catching this with us now or on replay? Let us know. Tag Erica, tag myself if there's any specific question that you want to have. You know, it's impossible to deal with the crafting of a document and the strategy of a document in a 30-minute masterclass. It really is. <laughs> but we're well, we're available to come back again. So let's see how this goes. Let's see how people respond to it. It really is my um, absolute honor and pleasure to be able to use the platform of LinkedIn and LinkedIn Live to invite guests like Erica to share their knowledge and share their top tips and give people some advice and some tools to start to be able to shift and change their thinking around this important career asset, this career searching tool. So it's wonderful that we're, we're able to do this. And, and I'm thankful to LinkedIn for this amazing platform. When I was a recruiter, my goodness, it was email and fax days. I mean, you know, <laughs> it changes things, right? Absolutely. It completely changes things in the access to information. So, Erica, I'm going to invite you to, you're going to be hanging around in the comments answering any questions, share the links of any blog posts that, you've, that you'd that you like to share. I'll be doing the same. I did write a blog about why you must never put references on a CV. Um, and I would like to invite everybody to, Please follow Erica because she posts incredible content on LinkedIn Thank and she you. really is a supporter of people within my industry, which is the career strategy industry, helping people get clarity around their roles and clarity around their direction in terms of knowing what to do with the, the CV that they have. Um, but I suspect just saying this publicly, that we might be back again, that we might come back <laughs> for another conversation sometime down the line. So, Thank you for your time, lovely. Erica. Thank you for everything that you've shared. I'm going to um, close off now because we wanted to keep it short, just 30 minutes bite size, but um, we'll be seeing you again. So mm -hmm. thanks to everyone and look forward to your questions in the comments.